<laughs> well, I want you probably to begin this morning by turning to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, and you will either put your finger in your Bible to hold your place or keep doing this on your screen. <laughs> I mentioned that we have uh, a prayer focus for this month, <clears throat> and I want, I want to talk about prayer this morning. Now, that, that's a pretty broad subject, <coughs> so I'm not going to cover all of it this morning. Uh, we do have the month to cover a good part of it, and so we'll talk about it throughout the month. Right now, the plan is for Pastor Eric to preach next Sunday morning, um, and I did talk to him, and he'll probably be, be discussing prayer as well. But Luke chapter 11 is the chapter where we find the Lord's Prayer, is what we call it. And the disciples came to Jesus in verse 1 and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, most of us have probably at times recited the Lord's Prayer and know it or, you know, know it pretty well. And is it um, sins or trespasses, are we going to say this time that? But anyhow, we, we kind of, like a lot of things in Scripture, we lose the context, but that prayer was given to us by Jesus when His disciples came to Him and, and they specifically asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, if I came to you this morning and said, would you teach me math? I have no idea how to do math. You wouldn't start with calculus. You'd start with simple addition to teach me math. So when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he gave them that prayer as a pattern. But, remember, He was just beginning to teach them to pray. In other words, you can't go your whole life thinking that you are praying like God wants you to pray if all you ever say is the Lord's Prayer. It is rudimentary. It is elementary. It, it's, it's the basic this three-verse prayer that Jesus gave. <clears throat> now, I, I kind of, my little example is, is kind of logic. You know, it's just a simple reasoning of they had asked to be taught to pray and Jesus began with the beginning because that's what we do. But you can also look at Scripture and see that there were other ways that Jesus encouraged that Jesus prayed, first of all, by, on His own, and He also encouraged His followers to pray. So Jesus prayed many other prayers, <clears throat> and, and they weren't exactly like this one. This one was meant to be a pattern as they learned to pray. In fact, Luke chapter 11 goes on with many other lessons in prayer. Um, the, in fact... The very next thing that Jesus says after the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray. And he says, when you pray, pray like this. And he gives them that simple pattern. And then he launches in, as he often did, into a parable. And, and it's a parable that most of us who have been around church know about the persistent person who kept on knocking and insisting on their needs being met. What Jesus is saying is, here's your pattern of prayer, but here is to be your attitude in prayer. <clears throat> and, but, but that's not all. I, even in this chapter, it goes on. Um, in verse 9, Jesus gives another very familiar admonition. Many of us will recognize this. We've heard it. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And then he finishes the thought of this passage by teaching how willing, this isn't just like 
and he just wraps it up. This is like the culmination of the lesson when he talks about how willing the Holy Spirit is to hear. But even when, <clears throat> even when we don't know for what we should be asking, the Holy Spirit is poised, ready to give us good things. Now, the problem is we don't always recognize good things as being good things. Sometimes we think things that are good really aren't good. <clears throat> but what Jesus is saying is He's ready, the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Godhead, is ready to give you the very best things that you need for this life and the life that comes after. <clears throat> I, I, it's kind of like the thought that the psalmist had in Psalm 37, 4. Another familiar scripture, and we hear this part of it, delight thyself in the Lord. Oh, and He shall give thee des the desires of thine heart. And we like that last part. Oh, if I want... And, and God is like... Santa Claus, you know. Oh, he said, if I want it, I'll get it. But there is a prerequisite, and it's that we delight ourselves in him first. And then we realize that what we think is so great really isn't so great. And what we think might not even... Well, it probably... If, you, if you're not living this life understanding that there's a hereafter that we're bound for eternity and we need to be right with God, if you're not living that with that in mind, you're not going to delight yourself in the Lord. But when that comes together, you realize that the things of this world, as, as Jesus said, they're going to rust, they're going to rot away, they're going to be useless someday. <clears throat> but the things of God are far more rewarding than anything this world has to offer. The fact that the God who made us, the, the great God, the God who is the ruler of the whole universe, He's larger, stronger, wiser, and bigger than we can even comprehend. He, he is, and yet He made you and I. That's how we got here. In, in this curious set of circumstances in which we find ourselves, God put us here and He made us. But He didn't just leave us. His, his heart's so full of love for people that He made that He came and dwelt with us. He, he came and said, I'm going to slip into, out of my role, if in a sense, although God never has to abdicate the throne of the universe to do what he did. And yet, he says, I'm going to come be one of you, so instead of trying to say this is what you need to do, I'm going to slip in among you and show you how to live God's way. Well, now Isaiah 59. And this is... Um, well, this is just an honest look of the conditions, of what conditions were in Israel and um, in the days of Isaiah, Israel and Judah. And you're going to find that there's some parallels to our day, I believe. But I'm going to be, begin reading in verse number 9. So Isaiah 59, verse 9, and I'll read through verse 16. Therefore is judgment far from us. And, and what he's saying is, is kind of summed up in the next little phrase. Neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. Are you getting the picture? The, the very people... Who, who make up society. This isn't a fringe. This is not the edge. They don't even understand what justice is. And when they seek for fairness from the people who should be judging fairly, it's not there. 
And as a whole, they are walking in complete darkness. And they're like a blind person who, who can't see where they're going and they find a wall and they grope along that wall trying to find their way. We grope for the wall like the blind and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. That, that sounds kind of funny, but when you think about it, it's if you've ever seen anybody who's just completely lost and in agony, they don't worry about how, what noise is. It's just from the soul. And there they are. They can't see. They're lost. They're roaring, they're mourning. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. From us. And, and let me just say this, it's not because God doesn't offer salvation. They were the ones who had moved away from God. And you see that in the next verse. For our transgressions are multiplied before Thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing, and look at this, lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Did you catch that? <clears throat> if there was someone within that society who tried to stand up and say, wait a minute, that's what Isaiah was doing. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Do you not see that we're headed for destruction? As a nation they were. It, it's borne out in Scripture that we're, this, we're at that point in the history of Israel and Judah. Headed for destruction, there is no righteousness left. Everyone is wrapped up in idol worship. And as a result, there's no fairness. The judges who should be judging the people are judging according to who pays them, pays them the most. Families are destroyed. The weakest are oppressed. That's how it was. <clears throat> and if somebody stood up and said, hold on a second, this is all wrong. Hold on a second. You can't sac your, sacrifice your babies to the god Molech and be right and be God's people. You can't kill your own offspring and any good come from it. You couldn't stand up and say that. Because Scripture says that in that society you would have become a prey. You would have been sought out and you would have been devoured by the evildoers. That's how it would have been. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man. And he wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. Listen, <clears throat> I've been talking to you about the way it looked in that day. Verse 16 that I just read to you says that God wondered that there was no intercessor. That there was no one who looked on and said, look at the sins of our society. Look at the sins of God's people. That those who should be protecting the innocent and the poorest among us will sell out for money. 
And those who have the most, who should be most compassionate on those who are suffering, will actually take from the poorest to put it in their pocket. That's not their only sin. How did they get there? It was really a very simple thing. God had said, you'll only have one God in this nation. And they had said, but we feel kind of funny when these people over here who are our friends have a different God. And, and they're happy to even bow down to our God, so shouldn't we bow down to theirs? We're just trying to be nice. We're just trying to get along. And slowly but surely, idol worship crept in. At this stage in their society, they hadn't completely cast off some sort of a worship of God. It wasn't real. It was fake worship. But they mentioned His name with the other gods. They made themselves feel good. They still had a temple. But they didn't honor it. They would put other idols in there or worship, and in, in it was fake worship because you can't worship God and idols at the same time. But they did. They, they gave lip service to Jehovah God. And yet they still violated what God had taught them about how to conduct themselves in righteousness, whether it be how they treated the poor and the widows and those who were <clears throat> unfortunate in their society, or how they treated their own offspring, or how they lived their lives morally. It, it's, you, you, if you read through this section of the Bible and you see in, in the major prophets and on into the minor prophets, more than once God says, you're going after your neighbor's wife. And, and it really does sink farther down to men pursuing men and women, women, and all of those perverse things. And in their hearts it got darker and darker. And there was no one who carried the burden for the people of Israel and their iniquity. Those who did go to temple in their pseudo-worship were never burdened for the sins of God's people. And they certainly never brought them in prayer to stand in the gap for God's people. I told you you would see some parallels today. And uh, I know that it's popular among some people to, to point the finger in our day at certain people who, are, who might be wealthy. I don't know. I mean, that's all by definition. And, and say, they're the problem in society. And I know that on the other side of the aisle, some people would say, no, not really, you know, that we're in America and we can live that way. Whatever. Um, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to make a political statement here. But the facts of the matter are that God teaches His people whether they are wealthy or poor to have compassion on people even and, and we're even talking about their circumstances. And yet in our day, and there are those who, who will, and I'm going to get specific here, I, I don't mean to, once again, I'm not trying to be political, but there are people who will pull up to a street corner and, and roll their window down and even put a $20 bill out there for somebody standing on the street corner to grab And that soothes their conscience. But they give no thought to what has happened in our society. That while they slip a $20 bill out the window, 
every winter there's more and more people who are trying to survive on the streets of our cities. You see, <clears throat> I didn't know I was going to get into this one this deep, but it, it's something that I carry on my heart. What's wrong? And there are those who defend the homeless people's right to live that way, and they get very, very upset if a camp is broken up, and I, I'm, you know, I understand that it's tough, but, but why are we not saying to ourselves and within our society, what's happened that they've even come to the place where instead of us saying, why are people living on the streets in horrible conditions, we're actually just worried about making sure that they can sleep under the bridge. It's kind of mixed up to me. But that's, I don't want to dwell there because there are things that are very, very glaring within our society as well. I'm, I'm being real specific this morning. I mentioned the fact that the Israelites <clears throat> sacrificed their children to the god Molech, and they did. They, they would take that god and it was metal with its arms out and they would heat it up and throw their children in and their children would die. They were sacrificing their own children to a God and were, were astonished. And yet, every day in our society, people sacrifice their own children and put their own desires, their own wishes, their own plans above the children of our country. I think about the people who have um, in their own way maybe at times tried to speak out against um, some of the issues in our society involving morality. <clears throat> it's true. If you don't support gay marriage, you're a hater. And cancel culture is alive and well, taking out people that <clears throat> dare to try to have an opposing opinion. We're getting to the point where if you have an opinion that is in juxtaposition to that of the popular culture, you try to say something, you can lose your job and lose everything in your life. And I think we're getting to the point where you could be jailed or fined. It's happening in Canada. I'm not trying to paint in this ugly picture. It just is what it is. I'm not scared, by the way. I just want you to know that. But it is where we are. It is how it's happening. <clears throat> if you're a Christian, you're a fool in our society all too often. At least that's how we feel. You know, I'm amazed at times how you think, oh, they're going to look at me, and then you, you find out, oh, that person's a Christian actually. But the, the messages that we get day after day after day are that Christianity... Christianity isn't for people that are smart. You either have to choose between science or religion. That's, that's what we're told. And if you try to stand up and say, well, this is brand new. Let me tell you about all these scientists that were religious. You can't say that. Christianity's under fire. Sexual deviancy is rampant. We've seen that borne out in a highly publicized trial in the last couple of weeks. And while my son and daughter-in-law were here, my daughter-in-law said she had taken a screenshot on her phone of something she had found. She said, I know it'll be gone. It won't, it won't stay. I think she had four pages of people's names that had, that had been 
prosecuted in either high-level government positions or even um, in Congress. Not, not for stealing money. Not for cheating on their wives. They had child pornography in their presence and their possession. I don't know if you understand. Or it, it, I realized something when she said that and I thought about it because she was, she was reading it to me. I realized that our government actually condones. It has to. It's made up of people engaged in it. Where do you think our government is heading as far as its position on child pornography, which actually is child abuse? Let's, let's just be real clear. Nothing will damage a child for life more than being used sexually as a child. Nothing. And there are people who are saying, but if I want it, what happens to that child is of no consequence to me. I'm taking it. And we think that's horrible, and then we add to, to it this. And these are people who are running our government. That's where we are. <clears throat> that very attitude cheapens life across the board. It makes the person who... this and. This is where the real parallel is between what we read in Isaiah and our society today. The person who has the power gets to write what morality is. And the person with the power says, if I want it, I'm taking it, and nobody's going to tell me it's wrong. I don't care who I hurt. That's the bottom line. That's what was going on in those days, and that's what's going on in our society today. <clears throat> In other words, if, if you have the power and you can get away with it, anything is okay. Anything is all right. I can do it. And people, if they need to, will just look at you and lie. And you're going, in your mind, everybody knows that's a lie. But it doesn't matter. You just say it over and over again. That used to be for people who weren't getting it anywhere in life. But now it's the norm. <clears throat> By the way, I'm using notes from seven years ago almost. And I have, work is for stupid people. I think that was, I mean, that was seven years ago. Where were we seven years ago as opposed to today? God and Jesus, and I've even seen people using the Holy Spirit, that, those words, in ways that are incredibly astonishing. People, people who are in no way being religious actually saying something like, Holy Spirit, be unleashed. I, I, I'm not talking about Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church. I hope I didn't offend. Well, okay, if I did, I did. <clears throat> I'm talking about people that are just messing around on TikTok or whatever. And I think, oh my goodness. They don't even know what they're talking about. They don't even understand that the Holy Spirit isn't something that I get to unleash. What are you doing talking that way? Not to mention how people use the name of God and Jesus Christ every day in common language. God asked the question. I read it to you in verse 16 that comes down to us today. Who is looking on? Who is carrying who is going to be an intercessor? In that day, he said, I'm going to read it to you again. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. 
Do you think that God is looking on in our society today? Looking for somebody who sees this and it hurts them? It hurts them that people are living like this and, and that something needs to change and people are being hurt and there's nobody that can even stand up for them. I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> I better hurry. <clears throat> there's no one. Or is there? I'm talking about prayer this morning. And I'm talking to us in this society, in this day, in this age, where we are. Can God look on this morning, little group here, say there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one who, not that we're angry, it's not necessarily about one or two bad guys. It's about the people that God loves being oppressed by that kind of wickedness. Their eyes being blinded. They can't even see where they're going. And it breaks God's heart. As I said to you as we read a little bit farther up in the chapter, it says there was no salvation. Or salvation was far from them. And salvation was far from them because they were far removed from God. And that's not what God wants. But God's looking for people to be the intercessor. God's looking for people to stand in the gap. And I told you, Luke chapter 11, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gave them the Lord's Prayer. Three short verses. But then we get to look on. Through, through all of the Gospels we can look on. And we've studied John chapter 17 in the last few months. That great prayer of Jesus where he prays for his disciples. In, in John chapter 17 verses 6 through 19. And then I preach very specifically on John 17, 20 where he begins to pray for us. But Scripture also teaches us <clears throat> that His prayers for us never end. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be heard, or I'm sorry, uttered. This is what I'm saying to you this morning that, that Scripture says to us. God's looking for somebody, and we might say, I am entirely inadequate. But God doesn't need you to be a great orator for Him to hear your prayer. He doesn't need you to feel righteous all the time for Him to hear your prayer. He's just looking for somebody who will say within themselves, I'm going to get in touch with God, whatever that looks like, however it ta whatever it takes. And when we get on our knees and we start to draw toward God, the Holy Spirit Himself is looking on. And He begins to intercede for us. Within the Godhead, it looks something like this. Here's a poor, we're ignorant, okay? Here's a poor, ignorant human being who's gotten on his knees and just begun to open his heart. And the Holy Spirit comes down. And he takes those words. And in the translation from where we are in all of our broken humanity, in our broken world, on, on, it, the Holy Spirit takes our words to the throne room of heaven. To God the Son. 
who sits next to God the Father. Now, I, I have to do it. I, I just can't help myself. That is not three gods. God the Son is given of God the Father to be a representative to us to show that He identified with us. It's God the Son is God the Father showing His love. And yet at the same time, He set it up so it works in reverse. He gave the, whole, the Holy Spirit came in all of His power on, on, at the day of Pentecost. And now He's the God with us. And so He's taking our words and our heart to God the Son who by design <laughs> turns to God the Father God's love turns to God the just one and says, here's their, here's their words. This is what they were trying to say. This is what they couldn't say. And this is what the Holy Spirit has added. And God the Father turns to God the Son and says, because of what you did, because of the sacrifice that is represented, because of the humanity that's re represented, I hear and I answer. Not my broken words. I don't even know what to say a lot of the time. And, and maybe you're pious and you do, but I bet you don't. <laughs> <clears throat> and he turns and he says, answer it. Because God always answers prayer. One way or the other. But he says, answer it for their good. Not what they want. It's been interpreted now. By our heart. It comes from our heart to his heart. And his heart is to give us good. I, I think we miss that sometimes. You know, because people say, well, it's not always easy to be a Christian, and that's true. People give their lives for being a Christian. But our lives, what did the Apostle Paul say? For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. When you have that eternal perspective, it changes your, your hold on this life. And you realize that the things that are the desire of my heart are eternal. And if I must lose this life to gain Him, I'll do it. Wow, that's, I know that's strong, folks. We're, God made us to hang on to this life with all we have. He made us that way. <clears throat> and yet at the same time, we have a different perspective. Well... And that was just one verse, my goodness. Verse 34. <clears throat> who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Or the love of Christ? Who? Tribulation? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? Peril? Sword? No. As it is written, for thy sake... We are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all, thing, all these things, what? We are more than conquerors. Conquerors through Him that loved us. That's all that picture in the intercession of the Holy Spirit to the Son interceding for us still today to the Father. Hebrews 7.25 It's in Hebrews that we're given the picture of Jesus Christ as being the absolutely perfect high priest. Wherefore, He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. Seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for us. If we're going to learn to pray, we need to learn to understand this. That God is looking for people. Just common humanity that's let God work within their hearts and given them a burden to intercede for people. But we're not interceding on our own. It's, it's not our work alone. It's a work that we come into communion with the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit 
is in communion with the Son, and the Son is in communion with the Father, and they're all in communion together. And Jesus in John chapter 17 was praying that we, as believers in this day, would come into that communion, that fellowship. And that's how we can intercede. It's, it's hard to put it in a nutshell in the few minutes that I have. So I'm going to try to say this. The apostle said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gave them an example. And then he began to show them. And as he showed them, he showed them what intercessory prayer was. And he called them to intercessory prayer. And the whole New Testament goes on to teach about the different components involved in intercessory prayer. And we're one of them. So as we leave today, I want to ask you some some very specific questions. One would be, have you heard that call? Is there something within you when you see and you hear those people in society saying and doing those things and you know that it hurts God and it's hurting them? Is there something within you that that your heart just breaks? I, I know... It's a heavy load to bear, but what I'm telling you is that God can put that burden on you, but then He helps you carry it. But have you felt that? Does it matter to you when you think about the direction of our society that I've mentioned? And and understand this, I understand that we're just one person. And I'm not telling you that the answer to this is to go be A one-man wrecking machine thinking you can fix it all. But I am telling you that there's a God in heaven who's calling you to intercede. And He has to put that burden on you. Does it matter to you? Do you want to learn to pray? One more scripture from Ezekiel that I want to read to you. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, stand in the gap before me in the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And I want us to stand together this morning. And the final question that I want you to consider is when God looks for a man to stand in the gap among humankind, are you going to be the one Who's standing in the gap? Am I going to be the one standing in the gap? Or will he have to say, I found none? Let's bow our heads together. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for the way that when we're weak, you become strong. And the way that You've promised that if we'll turn our hearts toward You and come into communion and fellowship with You as we attempt to be intercessors, that You'll take our attempts and You'll add to them what needs to be added and You'll interpret what needs to be interpreted and You'll take it as our prayer, but it'll be perfected by You. We thank You for that, Lord. We pray that You'll give us a heart this morning that's burdened by the people that are not just so far from You in our society, but that are in such opposition to You and to what's good and what's right. Lord, I pray that You'll help us to be those who can stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And that when You turn and You look and You seek for somebody to do that, that You'll find some that the answer will not be And I found none. Oh God, go with us as we leave this place. Do something within us that we can be Your ambassadors in this world in which we live. We pray that You'll help each one of us to live for You, to serve You, and draw closer to You. In Your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.